Hello everyone. There is a book by Ben Lerner, uh, published in 2016, which is called The Hatred of Poetry. This book was recommended to me by my friend Tyson Woolman, and I find it quite interesting. It is a treatise on poetry, if you don't mind that, that fancy word, a meditation on the topic of poetry. And I think it's a very nice and interesting way of entering into a topic like introducing any topic by first talking about the hatred of it. So imagine talking about the hatred of philosophy as a way of introducing philosophy or the hatred of psychology, the hatred of science, the hatred of psychoanalysis, and in this case, the hatred of poetry. As it turns out, as, as Ben Lerner argues, this is especially useful in the case of poetry because the hatred of poetry as Ben Lerner points out, is not an accidental feature and it is not a result of contingent historical, cultural, societal conditions, circumstances that we find ourselves in. Hatred of poetry has something to do with poetry itself. It, is, it seems to be related to the essence and the functions of poetry. And by identifying you know, in a casual manner, different kinds of hatreds that are directed towards poetry, we can access different sides and different aspects of poetry. So in this sense, it's a nice way of getting into the topic. So let's begin. Let's begin by talking about, you know, joining Ben Lerner and talking about kinds of hatred, ways in which we might or other people might have this hateful response, emotional response, intense dislike towards poetry or poems. First, uh, we might, you know, point out or this tacit assumption. I think even children in school, when, when we are kids in school, we tacitly understand this, that understanding poems, appreciating po poems, writing poems and reading poems is a very intimate act. And it's an act that is very powerful in its effect in, com in, in bringing people together and creating communities. So we, we understand this function of poetry, this community creating function. And creating, creation of a community involves setting boundaries and including people inside a community. And that boundary setting function necessarily involves excluding some people. And that feeling of exclusion, that understanding that, okay, I get it that poetry or this, this set, of, set, set of poems are supposed to connect us, create a sense of community, but I happen to be one of those people who are excluded by, by these poems. I don't get it. I don't feel like I'm belonging, so I hate it. So that's, that could be one reason. So in this reason, in this aspect or this kind of hatred, we get, to some, we get access to something. We, something is revealed to us, and that is a desire, our desire that, uh, let's join Lerner here, I'm quoting, quote, the desire that the poem must include me, must recognize me and be recognizable. So recognizable, I should be able to recall it without ever having seen it, like the face of God. So the face of God expectation here is that even if I have never tried to read and understand poems before, I should be able to understand, access, recognize, and be recognized, be included by, by poetry. So that's one. Another side of poetry, something that is associated with it, and something that is also linked to a kind of hatred, has to do with the attitude of um, child, childlike or childish playfulness. So that attitude is, is a non-functional attitude, is, is an attitude that is not concerned very strictly with communication, clear communication, communication towards an end. So let's get on the same page. Let's be as clear as possible to get something done, to get clear about something in the world. So that childish playfulness that is associated with poetry can tolerate not getting anything concrete done, not getting anything done with words, with language, with the use of language, but just letting it be an examination of words, an examination of language and concepts itself. And it can tolerate ambiguity, that childish playfulness, that, not, that, that kind of non-seriousness, which can be serious in its own way, it can tolerate ambiguity. 
So let me give you some examples from my recent conversations with students. So on Wednesdays, Wednesday afternoons, Hong Kong Macau time, uh, we get together in an online hangout group with a group of students who are interested in joining this discussion group. And in this discussion group, we don't really talk about anything. We talk about nothing and everything. So the agenda is to not have any strict agenda, to be flexible, to let ideas and questions come to us. And in one of those discussions, you know, occasionally something interesting happens with the play of words, with this ambiguous childlike playfulness. So we were talking about friendship. In one of the meetings, we ended up discussing the topic of friendship, what friendship is. And we were going, do, going doing this back and forth thing. Each person was adding a bit to the discussion. And we ended up considering this idea that friendships might also have expiry dates. So what does that mean? What else does that remind us of? And it reminded me of canned food because canned food is associated in my mind with a very late expiry date. So longer periods of preservation. But then we also thought about, you know, the act of opening the canned food and shortening the, the expiry date, so bringing it closer. So when you open a can, can of food for the first time, you make it expire faster. And so this reminded us of uh, when you put a very big demand to a friend, it's like that act of opening a canned food, asking for a big favor from your friend that might lead to a rapid expiry of your friendship. So this is something that can happen more easily, more readily in a context of a casual, non-functional conversation that can tolerate ambiguity and playfulness. Another time we were talking about jokes and humorous moments. When, when is it that in a conversation some, something funny happens? Some, someone says something funny without planning to, without intending to be funny. And we use the metaphor of a cat. We said that a joke or a humorous moment in a conversation is like the arrival of a cat. You cannot control when the cat comes to you. We I mean, can try, but usually we fail to control the movements of the cat. The cat is interested when the cat in, is interested. So a joke is like a cat. It comes to you on its own volition. It happens on its own. You cannot really try to control it. When you try to control it too much, it might backfire. So this childlike playfulness is something that most of us as adults, responsible, serious adults with jobs and, uh, you know, responsibility and uh, our roles and our status. We don't permit ourselves to be childlike like that. We don't permit ourselves to use language in a playful way. And therefore, we find it maybe intolerable for other people to also use that kind of liberty, liberty with language. So because we don't allow ourselves, we hate poetry because it reminds us of, of something, a kind of freedom, a kind of play that we don't permit ourselves to enjoy. So that's a second, maybe a second kind of hatred. Now we get to more serious, more um, professional, maybe these are poets' own hatreds of poetry. So these, these poets, poets' hatred of poetry, this itself bifurcates into two categories. And this more serious, more advanced, more developed kind of hatred has to do with the understanding or the assumption that poetry has these standards to meet, that there are these expectations and poetry is failing to live up to its expectations. So fulfilling the task of a poem is important. And when a poem is failing to fulfill its task, this group of these two types of critics end up hating poems and poetry. The first of these two kinds of critics is uh, relatively conservative, it represents a conservative attitude, and Lerner describes them as nostalgists. Nostalgists means they remember a golden age in the past when poetry and poets met these standards, met these expectations, and fulfilled the task of poetry at back then. So he mentions Walt Whitman, and people who associate Walt Whitman with a time where poetry achieved success, achieved this task of unifying a group of people, a nation, and creating bonds, creating a kind of ground for understanding. And these nostalgists, Lerner points out, that they forget that the attention, Whitman's attention was not towards his present time, but his attention was, his hope was towards a future, 
when that those tasks, the task of you know creating bonds and unities and universalities, will be fulfilled. So he did something that was a promise, a hope for a future. He did not create a golden age. He did not enact and live, embody the fulfillment, an absolute completion, completion of a task. It was something that he promised and hoped for the future. This reminds me of my conversation with Sam Rocha, which we did a while ago. In that conversation, Sam Rocha briefly talked about tradition, and he said that traditions don't, uh, they are not meant to serve the past. A tradition has everything to do with the future. It is, its attention is oriented towards the future, its aims and its, its attentions. So that's the nostalgist or conservative criticism of poetry, which understandably can result in a particular kind of hatred, hatred because the golden age is gone and the present time and the foreseeable future, all we get is bad poems. <laughs> On the other hand, we have another set of critics who come from a more liberal side and they associate poetry with avant-garde. So this is the avant-garde criticism of poetry. For these people, any poem that can be recognized and labeled by people by the established order, by the academy, for example, or by a community of po poets. Any piece of work that can get that label, it can be recognized, it can be assimilated into culture with the label of a poem, is not radical enough. It is not shaking the foundations of culture enough because it is recognizable. So that means that it cannot affect change. It cannot have cultural consequence, societal consequence, and more importantly, most importantly, political consequence. So avant-garde demands from poetry to have political and cultural consequence, impact. So when we get put all these reasons for hating poetry, when we put all these reasons together, we might summarize them by saying that the hatred of, hatred of poetry comes from placing an impossible demand or a very um, idealistic demand to, from poetry, demanding the impossible from poetry. And because that, that impossible demand cannot be fulfilled, the result is the hatred of poetry. And just by rem remembering poet, the concept of poetry, we kind of tacitly, subconsciously anticipate all these demands, anticipate the failure of the fulfillment of these demands, and then the, the hatred just surfaces as a result. Now, how do we respond to this? Is there a, a way out of the hatred of poetry? Is there a way we can ameliorate or um, kind of still have some relationship with poetry as readers or as writers of poems? I think Lerner's position here is attached to an idea that a poem is never complete. A poem never represents something that is fulfilled and something that represents an accomplishment, something that is giving substance to us, like giving us information or giving us a recipe for success or recipe for happiness. Instead, what poetry does, what poetry accomplishes, is the creation of a place. Place for what? Place for poetry or place for the what Ben Lerner following Marianne Moore called the genuine, a place for the genuine. So Lerner says that there is no such a thing as genuine poetry, but there is there are places for it. So there's only a place for it. In other words, what poetry does, this is my reading of it, poetry intensifies a lack, intensifies an absence or an awareness, our awareness of a lack, like awareness of an unfulfilled desi uh, desire or an unfulfilled promise. Let me include here one quote from the book. We read, quote, Poetry is a word for a kind of value no particular poem can realize. The value of persons, the value of a human activity beyond the labor-leisure divide, the value before or beyond price. Thus, hating poems can either be a way of negatively expressing poetry as an ideal, a way of expressing our desire to exercise such imaginative capacities to reconstitute a social world, or it can be a defensive rage against the mere suggestion that another world, another measure of value is possible." End quote. So this is that 
irritation that don't remind me of counterfactual worlds, don't remind me of like being able to dream and imagine differently because that will only lead to you know disillusionment and disappointment. That's why we resist the, the invitation of poetry. So let me end this presentation, this kind of review, by saying that what Lerner invites us, the readers, to do is not to let go of our hatred of poetry, but to go with it, to examine it, inspect it. You know, combine that with our reading, with our relationship with poetry. See what that interplay between that emotional response and poetry or poems as objects, objects of our awareness or objects that mediate our awareness of the world. What else can that reveal? So let me read and end with that, with the last sentence of the book. Quote, all I ask the haters, and I too am one, is that they strive to perfect their contempt, even consider bringing it to bear on poems, where it will be deepened, not dispelled, and where, by creating a place for possibility and present absences, like unheard melodies, it might come to resemble love. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. Check out the book if you like, and uh, let me know what you think. Till next time.